We'll dive right in. My name is Priscilla Cordero. I'm the director of the Small Business Development Center here at Governor State University. Our center is funded by the Small Business Administration, the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, and Governor State University. And what we do briefly uh, is provide one on one, free one on one consulting to small business owners uh, in areas of business planning, strategic planning, financing, international trade. Uh, Mary Maz, uh, you may know, is the director of the International Trade Center here. That's, uh, we're one in the same program. And we thank you all for coming and want to make sure that you know that we are available after uh, this event. Any questions you may have, if we don't know the answer, we, we are a resource center and we will find you an answer, get you what you need. So thank you again. Uh, again, thank you to our panelists. I'm going to introduce, uh, first we have Chris Timmons on our furthest left here. Is that left? Chris Timmons joined Canadian National Railway, Railway CN in September 2014 as Senior Solutions Manager within the Supply Chain Solution Group, Solutions Group. Prior to joining CN, Chris spent nine years at UTI a top international third-party logistics company where he held several management positions in international freight forwarding across the U.S. and Canada. Chris has experience, experience developing global air, ocean, intermodal, and customs brokerage solutions for clients in a multitude of industry sectors including automotive, high-tech, retail, and pharmaceuticals. Prior to his experience in international freight forwarding, Chris spent three years working as a mechanical supervisor as part of Norfolk Southern Railways Management Trainee Program. Chris holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Georgia Tech and also holds certificates in Georgia Tech's Cooperative Work Study and Engineering Entrepreneurship Program. Thank you, Chris. We also have Ms. Victoria Linko, CEO of Funk Linko. Uh, Vicki worked her way up from cleaning offices to CEO in the male-dominated world of steel manufacturing. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm so happy we have a woman on the panel. Better known as Vicki, she and her family are keeping the legacy alive at the 90-year-old company located in Chicago Heights, Illinois. Vicki has been leading the company for more than 28 years. Funk Linko is a certified minority and woman-owned business. It is a leading producer of sign, light poles, and steel fabrication for major oil companies, fast food operations, hotels, car dealers, airports, and municipalities in the U.S. and many countries abroad. Their work includes the McDonald's high-rise poles holding up the Golden Arches and the 1985 O'Hare Airport Lighting System Rehab, which included light poles on and off the runway, parking lots, and international terminals. Funklinko has built more than 200 train locomotive frames, some of which have been shipped overseas the, to the Caribbean islands, South America, and Saudi Arabia. Customers include CSX Corp, Burlington Northern Santa Fe Corp, Union Pacific Corp, and the U.S. Army. This is important as well. Funklinko has been a client of the Chicago Minority Business Opportunity Center and the Chicago Minority Business Enterprise Center. Vicky was a part of Minority Business Development Agency's U.S. delegation of 12 minority-owned firms. And I did skip Tom between Chris and Vicki here. We have Mr. Tom Bute, Senior Vice President and Director of International Services Group for Wintrust Financial Corporation. Tom is Senior Vice President and Director of Wintrust Financial Corporation's International Services Group. It's a $20 billion financial services holding company for a group of 15 Chicago and Wisconsin-based community banks. The Wintrust International Services Group supports the bank's commercial and retail bank customers for all activities involving cross-border trade finance, foreign exchange payments and hedging strategies, global payment business standby letters of credit, and cross-border guarantees. Tom joined Wintrust four years ago after spending 14 years with ABN Amro Bank and three years with Bank of America. While Chicago is his home base, Tom has had assignments in Hong Kong, Detroit, and Shanghai during his time with ABN Amro. His banking career began in an international department at the First National Bank of Chicago after graduating from the University of Iowa. And last but not least, we have Mr. Carter Sterling, CEO of Sterling Lumber Company. Carter is the youngest of four brothers and a third generation owner of Sterling Lumber. He took over as president from his father in 2001. Since that time, the company has created multiple new product lines and has entered into new industries and has emerged as the leading manufacturer of ground protection products in the Midwest. 
Carter and his three brothers, Christian, Carson, and Cooper, have directed the company through a steep growth curve in the, growth curve in the last decade, growing from $5 million in revenues to over $105 million in 2014, and growing from 28 employees to over 165. Oh, yeah. Sterling primarily manufactures products that protect the environment and provide temporary job site access during the construction and maintenance of our global energy infrastructure. So let's give them a round of applause. For you guys. One thing I will note is you all have a little piece of paper. So I encourage you to write down any questions you have for the panelists. And we're gonna allow 15 minutes at the end. We'll collect those and I will collect them this way. Dania will collect those and bring those up to me and we'll get through as many of them as we can. I'm gonna turn it over to the panelists and give them each a few minutes to fill in the gaps as far as the bios that I shared. Tell, tell us a little bit more. We'll start with Chris over here. Yeah, certainly. So, uh I currently work for CN in our uh, supply chain solutions group. Uh, most people don't think of the rail and uh, international business, but uh, we do have a group that focuses on putting end-to-end -end solutions together um, and international freight forwarding included around the world. Um, and Brazil's one of our, our focus spots. Uh, throughout my uh, really work history, I've done quite a bit of, of work with uh, Latin America and uh, you know, previous employers, uh, really my largest client uh, primarily did business with Brazil and Argentina as their major trade lanes. Uh, so I have quite a bit of experience in, in uh, ocean freight and air freight uh, in and out of there as well as the, the customs regulations and a lot of the, the different uh, variances there. And uh, so I'm very much looking forward to taking part in this panel and hopefully uh, answering your questions. Great, thanks. I'm uh, Tom Bube, and uh, um, I, I run the International Services Group for Wintrust. And for those that are not familiar with Wintrust, it's a holding company for a group of 15 community banks, one of which is down in this area called Old Plank Trail. And uh, we have a number of uh, banks throughout the region. Our focus is very much Chicago uh, and, uh, and the surrounding uh, communities uh, into the uh, southern part of Wisconsin. Uh, very much focused on uh, small business and middle market companies and uh, my focus is helping them in any way we can uh, to be successful uh, in their efforts to penetrate other, other markets. Uh, we deal with a number of different organizations uh, to accomplish that goal, including, as you heard from Mike Howard earlier, Exim Bank. Uh, we're also very active in working with uh, uh, the SBA uh, organization for uh, uh, some of their uh, export programs, and um, uh, as well as helping our customers mitigate risk uh, from, from anything from cross-border payments to uh, foreign currency uh, hedging strategies and so forth. So I uh, look forward to taking more questions on that and uh, on to you, I guess. My turn, huh? Yeah. Uh, I'm a small business and the way I deal with international is really an indirect. An indirect is uh, we make the product that goes overseas with a big company and we're sort of working on something with Sterling Carter here and myself. Uh, we've done the locomotives, uh, under frames, and even all the top of the frame. The only thing we don't do is the engine itself. Uh, we've shipped uh, anywhere from Saudi Arabia to uh, Tasmania, Croatia. I'm trying to think of all the countries. There's been about 10 countries that we, our frames have gone to. South Africa, there's an order coming up for South Africa. The company has been around 90 years, has seen its downs and ups. Um, I was in a downtime just recently and had a wonderful angel investor get me out of the slump. So I feel like it's really tough for me to say, but I'm the happiest woman in the world right now <laughs> that I know my company is going to succeed and move forward. And mm -hmm. it's one of the greatest joys of my life. Thank you so much. Funklinko is my passion. Um, everything will remain the same in the company. I will be running it still, uh, but it is my passion, and I want to get everybody that I had before I was up to 51 employees, and I want to put people back to work. 
that is one of the things that I've always strived for. I'm, I'm on the work, uh, Cook County workforce, and um, that's the dream to see people. And there's high skilled jobs, and I think that's what we need to. I, I heard some of the things today about how some students come in from other countries to learn here, and it would be great to see our own become so developed and in engineering and high skilled jobs and follow the wonderful American dream that is still there. Thank you. Well, nice, congratulations. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Carter Sterling, Sterling Lumber. I'm the one thing that's not like the others. Uh, I think when they built this panel, I think they, they chose me as kind of the, the rickety bridge between somebody who has no idea what they're doing and somebody that really knows what they're doing. <laughs> Over there. So, so th think of me as that rickety bridge in the middle. I've got a, some limited uh, experience with export. I have a ravenous desire to export more. Uh, for the first time in, in my company's history, we actually have a product and a value proposition that is exportable. Uh, would have been probably better timed when our dollar wasn't so strong. But uh, that's, that's, part of the that's part of the variables, right? That's part of what we'll probably talk about here. But, uh, and, and I bet you he has answers for that. <laughs> yeah, right. um, so we, I, I'll just touch on the product that I make very quickly because people often wonder what's a lumber yard and you know, what's a lumber company doing. We make temporary roads fundamentally and work platforms for the energy industry who has a lot of big equipment that goes into remote locations to build stuff. Maybe they're building power lines or they're building pipelines. And it, the old way was just driving through the mud and then they destroy all sorts of whatever from point A to point B and then they do their best to fix it and their best is never good enough. So nowadays we can distribute the load, they can go in, do their job, get out quicker and it's uh, a lot more like they've never been there. So private landowners, uh, environmentalists, everyone's very happy that we have these new ground protection products. So. That's the product that we manufacture and that uh, I've been mildly successful in exporting but uh, desirous to do more. So I probably should be on that side of the table but I'll, I'll share with you my trials and tribulations. And I'm gonna start with this question and whoever's able to best answer, <clears throat> feel free to speak up. Can you provide some examples of cultural differences and challenges that you've experienced with exporting or Tom that your clients may have experienced, particularly in Latin America. Chris can I, answer too. Yeah. I'll let Tom go first. Well, I was just gonna say, uh, I think uh, I have a lot of experience in Asia because I spent uh, many years working out over there and, and some of the more traditional, say, trade finance tools that uh, are very commonly used in, in Asia aren't necessarily as commonly used in, in uh, Latin America. Why that is, I'm not exactly sure, but it could be some of those cultural things that um, were discussed earlier, but uh, we have noticed that most of those types of tools are focused on Asia, not so much Latin America. We do see both, but not as, not as frequently. You know, I'll say from uh, my experience um, in doing business with them, one of the cultural differences I think was covered in the last presentation is, is there's a different value put on, on different things, and a lot of times, at least from a U.S. perspective, uh, there's an assumption that things are moving slowly, um, you get very impatient, and uh, you have to be very respectful that things are, are done differently. And if you're not, then uh, it can lead to just a, a blockade of, of moving forward. So um, recognizing that uh, you know, not only is there cultural differences, but differences in technology and a lot of things that can lead to things being done a different way, and um, that, that's out of your control, and uh, that uh, you have to exercise a lot of patience and, and understanding and not expecting it to work like it does, does here. May I say something? Of course. Uh, going to, to some of like China and all that, my best advice for anybody that's going to be traveling abroad or try to get business is study their culture. It's extremely important how you hand out a business card, uh, what, what the name that you call them, if you have to bow or whatever. It is very important that you do that because once you connect, it's in other countries I think it's more of the 
the, the friendly network instead of the business side of it, to be quite honest, or that's the way I view it. Um, don't be afraid if they touch you or hug you or give you a kiss. I mean, business is done different in different countries, like was given up on the, the screen a while ago. And it is extremely important. That's how you're going to close the deal. It's not going to be about price. It might be quality, but I'm going to tell you, if you build a relationship with that person, you'll have a better chance of getting a deal. I don't have much That's to contribute okay. to this one. Just watch out. They, they, they write the date differently. So if there's yeah. an expectation of delivery, <laughs> yeah, a delivery time deadline, yeah. Yeah. that whole date, day and month. Yeah, right, right. Fifth of January. Yeah, yeah right. May. Yeah, right, right. right. Be careful with that. <laughs> so true. So true. <laughs> what has been your greatest challenge in regards to exporting just in general? Maybe, Carter, you can also share some of the hesitations, or not even hesitations, but challenges and barriers. Yeah, I probably ought to take this one. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's not knowing what you don't know, right? That sounds really simple to answer that way. But you don't know what you don't know until you start moving forward, until you start getting momentum and you've dedicated yourself to the effort of, okay, I've got a product, I've got somebody interested. One of my very first experiences was actually shipping into the Dominican Republic. And, and, and I think it was a, a cultural reason why I got the opportunity. I, an inquiry came off the internet and instead of just responding, I actually made an effort to respond in their language. I speak just enough Spanish to be dangerous and usually get a, a drink at the bar. But I made an effort to respond to them in, in, in their language. And so mm -hmm. we created a bond, and then instantly I converted it back to English and said, no, I, I really don't speak your language. But, but we made a bond, and I had no idea what I didn't know. I was pretty naive, and I thought, well, it can't be that hard. Everybody does it. And, it, and fundamentally, it's not hard. But it's the little things that trip you up. And so uh, you know, after I experienced that one, and I made my way through, the product might still be sitting at the port in the Dominican five years later, I'm not sure. Once it got there, I, I was lucky that I wrote my quote up the way I did. It wasn't intentional, but um, you know, it's just the devil's in the details. And uh, so I, not knowing what I didn't know was my biggest challenge. I can add to that because um, uh, my family's from Argentina and I'm Latina. I tell my husband all the time, they just want you to, even if your Spanish is limited, make that connection. You think you feel uncomfortable because you're not speaking your language. Well, just taking that effort, even if your Spanish is, you know, this much, yeah. just that you tried to make that connection will automatically make someone comfortable. Sure. Um, Vicki, or uh, what has been your greatest challenge in oh, regards to export? Well, I mean, <laughs> I think we had some people come in from Australia and stuff like that and, and even South Africa into the shop and it's just building that connection and the trust, trust is very important that you're presenting to them and showing them what you're doing and that you're doing it right when it's gonna get back to their country. That is uh, an important thing and if you take them out to dinner, I had, um, I'm gonna give you a good example. I had the uh, Nippon Shurio chairman of the board come in and he came to Funk Linko and he said it's just going to be 15 minutes that's all you've got and he had his entourage with him and everything and they walked in and we started talking and he he actually started from welding in his own plant and now chairman of the board of Nippon Shurio and he was there and I said well I had sort of wanted to take you to lunch and he said I don't have time well, by the time we started talking, took him on the tour of the shop and everything, uh, he had another meeting and we went out to lunch. He started telling jokes and they were translated and they were funny. <laughs> but, <laughs> you have to laugh, right? But, uh, and, and he was late for his next meeting. So it was really wonderful. And because his, his company was over 100 years old. So it was really uh, just building that relationship again. Here we go, you know, that's what it was all about. And we did get a deal out of Nissan, no. so <laughs> that was good. I'll, I'll, I'll add one more topic, and it'll transition nicely to the smart people on the end. I, you know, mm -hmm. a after the challenge of, of making something and figuring out how to stuff it in a box and figuring out how to get that box somewhere and then get that thing somewhere, somewhere in there is the trust component of 
who's going to carry the risk burden of this? Mm -hmm. as the manu am I, as the manufacturer, going to carry all the risk and I'm going to wait until it gets to you before you pay me for it? Or are you going to prepay 100%? Because that's what I want. I want to take all the pressure off. I know that I'm good for it. I mean, come on, just pay me the money and I'll ship it to you, I promise. And, and so there is that, and that's significant. It's, it's yeah. insignificant on a small amount of money, but then they say, well, hey, that was perfect. I'll take eight gajillion of them. And you say, hold on a second, I hardly know you. How do we do this? And so that, that component scares me to death to this that's day. True. And I've had a lot of really smart people tell me what some of the options are but I still don't fully grasp what those options really are and what the cost of that is to me as the business owner. Can I absorb that and still manage to sell? Yeah. So that's one big challenge. Yeah, get, getting paid is, is really what you know, we as a bank try to step in and help our customers yeah. actually get paid. So um, you know, that's where I would say you need to have a conversation with your bank, see what kind of tools they can offer to help bridge that gap. I mean, what we see, the issue with a lot of uh, U.S. companies is they have an assumption that from a legal standpoint, it's the same as here, where, you know, con contracts are looked at the same way, laws are, are, are similar um, when they're not. And a lot of times, uh, you really need to look at some of the tools like, you know, people hate letters of credit, but, you know, it's, it's a standardized, uh, legal framework that everybody around the world knows and understands and so what you need is a uh, is a partner that can help you through that process and, mm -hmm. and kind of level the playing field in that sense uh, and then of course you get into the whole issues around uh, currency exchange so mm -hmm. you know, they're they're dealing in a different currency you're quoting them in dollars and you think everything is great but they're dealing with that issue on their side so um, so you've got to consider that when you're when you're pricing your, your, your product and when you're thinking about what's my, what's my underlying risk in this, in this sale because what if they don't have access to dollars? They've got to exchange those. Just in case we don't come back to currency later, I'll share a story on that one real quick. I, we started actually selling some of our ground protection into Western Alberta before we started selling it in the U.S. Um, based on the demand from the oil sands up there, the tar sands. And so in 2006, we started pumping product into Canada pretty hard and heavy. And the difference in the currency in 06 was negligible, maybe three or four cents, uh, maybe seven cents, seven percent. Um, and then as that relationship moved into 08, 09, things got ugly, then 10, 11, 12. By 2010, 11, 12, it was kind of status quo again, and we started shipping in. Well, in that time period, we created this idea that we want to make it very easy to transact with our clients. We opened up a bank account in Canada and said, hey, just it's convenient. Just pay us some Canadian funds. We'll absorb the couple of percent that it takes to bring the money back down into the U.S. We'll, we'll take that risk. And, and then we engaged, and I say we, I made a big, big mistake in 20... 13. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, 2012. End of 2012, I took an order. It, it, it essentially took me five months to process the order, which is a and big order. And I wrote the contract in Canadian dollars, as I had been doing for the last five, six, seven years. But in that window, that five month window, we went from being essentially on par to shoo, all of a sudden it was 15 cents, 17 cents, 18 cents. Today, I checked today just for curiosity, it's 25 cents the other way. So I don't make that much money on my product. Oh my gosh, I, the world would be a happier place for me if I did. So I couldn't possibly absorb it. I was lucky I had a business partner up there that, that let me slide out of it. And, we just, and I ended up having to give 300 day payment terms as an offset. They said, we'll pay you in the US dollars but we're gonna use you as our bank now and we'll hold your money for 300 days. And I said, hey, that's a deal. I can, you know, I talked to my bank and they, they absorbed that, but it could have been a lot worse than it was for FX, this whole currency exchange thing. So um, yeah, that's a doozy. <laughs> don't, don't, don't overlook it. Does the company need to have a bank in the country they're selling to in order to make those transactions? No, they do no. not. You can absolutely just use your bank here and they'll convert it for you. Um, for, for, for me, it was all about convenience. You know, if you are going to wire 
or, or, or use electronic funds transferring. It was a lot easier. There's two really large banks in this story in particular, and I know this is a Latin American form, I apologize, but there's two main players. It's the Royal Bank of Canada and it's HSBC. They, they command the market. So there's a better than 50% chance that they're going to bank with that bank, and, the, and so moving money is very simple. And so the thought behind it was, I just want to make it very painless, make it very easy to get my product into their hands and, and their money into my account. So um, it wasn't very easy. It was for a little while. So. Well, Tom, I, yeah. uh, I just, just want to follow I, up on that. Yeah. Uh, can you give us an example? Finish your thought, but can you give us an example of a client that has had a similar, us, situation. similar situation and ended up getting resolved yeah. uh, on your end? So um, two things. First thing was, I was going to say, in terms of opening accounts overseas, has the whole process of doing that has, the whole world has changed. And opening accounts overseas is, I mean, you've got to give up your firstborn to, to get that done nowadays. So um, if you can avoid it, I would recommend it. Um, in terms of, of hedging that type of exposure, I'll give you an example of a customer of ours. Uh, set, they have a contract with a buyer in Canada. Uh, the contract is usually signed at the beginning of the year and it covers a full year of uh, monthly shipments. I think each month is about $125,000 in, in product shipped in two increments. And uh, so at the beginning of the year, we set a hedge for them. So they purchase a con forward contract for us. We lock in the Canadian to US rate uh, in January with monthly, 12 month, uh, monthly contracts, all for the same rate. And um, I'll tell you, they are very happy right now because uh, you know, those Canadian dollars that they had agreed to receive for that contract are worth a heck of a lot less now than, than they were in the beginning of the year. So, um, and I'm talking about since it was last year, so it's actually carried through still into this year, that contract. But, um, but that's effectively how they do it, is that when, they're, when you set your price, beginning of the, uh, of the export cycle, you figure out what the exchange rate is and uh, what the forward market is like. So we uh, buy uh, a contract for, for our customer in the foreign exchange market, set the rate, there's, uh, there's some margins in there, so the, you know, what, whatever spot rate is is plus a margin to, to account for risk and things like that. Uh, and now you can sleep at night knowing that you're going to get paid every month and you're going to get the same USD for, for what you have, uh, had agreed to get in the beginning. That's great. Yeah. Chris, if I can ask you a question. I said I wouldn't put you on the spot, but um, sure. can you give the uh, participants in the room some advice on how exporters can decrease their logistic costs. Oh, uh, certainly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Call him. Well, I mean, one, one thing that, uh, in my experience that I've seen is, I mean, exporting around the world, it, it varies with every individual country that you're exporting to. And um, Latin America certainly is, it varies very uh, widely, you know, between Argentina and Brazil and Chile, et cetera. So one thing is obviously don't make the assumption that it's, it's the same in, in each one. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do to, to protect your risks, uh, as, as was being said before, you know, when it gets into exporting, um, there's international terms of trade, INCO terms, and they can be very complicated on who takes ownership of the goods at what point, who's covering the uh, logistics costs at various points around, and it's uh, not just simply as, you know, like putting a label on a FedEx package. When you get into it, it's uh, very complicated into, you know, who's paying to load the container, who's putting the container on the ship, who's paying that portion of the freight, the customs brokerage, the duties at the other end. and so. Um, I mean, my advice to you is, is if, if it's not something you're going to do on, on a regular basis, partner with somebody who is willing to walk through that with you as a logistics provider. Um, there's some that will give you a great rate, and, but don't look at just price of transportation um, because that can cut corners and you can end up in the end uh, 
you know, with a, a million dollar duty bill when you thought you were getting a, a cheap ocean freight rate or, um, you know, air freight rate or rail rate, et cetera. So make sure you're asking a lot of questions, that you're partnering with somebody who will walk through that if you're not very familiar with it, provide you the information. Um, and look at the total costs and, and, and the risk that you're gonna take and how much risk that you can take. Um, there may be cheaper ways of doing it, but it comes at a cost of risk, and, and you really need to understand that. And uh, you know, one thing that I've also found in, in Latin America is laws can change um, very quickly. I've, I've had customers ship stuff to Argentina in transit um, laws changed and all of a sudden there was a blockade on that uh, particular item that they were shipping and it sat at the port for six months um, and they couldn't get paid for the product until the uh, the consignee took you know ownership of those goods at the port so here you are sitting on millions of dollars of inventory that you can't do anything with so you know understand those risks that's not to hopefully not uh, to make anybody afraid to export, but uh, certainly um, do your homework on it and partner with somebody that uh, will explain those things to you and the various options that you have. Thank you. Go I'm going to say something. Uh, we, we started shipping uh, some of the poles to Venezuela, and boy, you've got to really check yourself with the sanctions, because like he said, the laws change so fast. It's crazy. And, and you better do your bill of lading right with your perform. Uh, it's cr you, but you really got to check into it before, even the day before you're shipping it out. It's great, but yeah. because the laws change. And, and there's things you may not even think about, like in Brazil, the bill of lading has to be signed with blue ink. <laughs> Black ink, it's stuck, you know. And and something you wouldn't even think about here. It's like why does it matter what color pen I use? It it does get down to that level of, of detail. Mm -hmm. um, it's true. So, you know, like you said, you, got, you really have to do your homework. If anyone can answer this, and it kind of ties into what you're saying, how did you go about identifying, if you have one, a distributor or agent in Latin America or someone to, to help with some of those, those challenges, not only doing your research, but um, having someone on, on the other end? The way I did it was uh, I looked it up on the internet, then I called Mary. <laughs> Help. Um, great resource. And, yeah, right. Oh, great resource, I'm telling you. And uh, before you ship it out, I guess it goes to uh, a port. I, I called just to double check everything because of the day and I had heard about the sanctions and all that and what you're shipping. You better, be, you, you really got to put the right item on there or else, you know, it's, it'll sit there for months and months, so. But I really did a lot of homework on it, so. Gotta study it, left and right, right and left. I would say, um, in just my experience in, in helping others uh, you know, get started overseas is, you know, there's really a lot of value in getting referrals from somebody in the country, you know. Um, there's so much information out there on the internet and, and uh, you know, how much of it you can trust and can't trust. But if, if you can build a relationship um, or talk to somebody else, a fellow business in the, in the area that, that's done business there and who they're using and get that referral, um, I think that goes a long way. And uh, yeah, not just go off of, you know, something that you're, you're reading on the internet. And to tie back into what Vicky was saying about calling Mary, have, have you received any other state or federal assistance with exporting, Carter, uh, Vicky? You know, I, I, I didn't. Um, I think I'm hoping to, right? <laughs> Call me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I like, like, and I don't wanna speak for, for a lot of small business owners, but you know, I, and my family, and for generations, we lived with blinders on. You know, I, I grew up with the mentality of we, you just, there's something to do, you just do it. Mm -hmm. You don't ask for help. And it's not, maybe it's a guy thing, maybe it's a family business thing, I don't know. But that's how I was raised, and it, to be perfectly frank, and I don't want to get too far off topic, it wasn't until I actually physically moved my entire business organization, and, and, and Reggie has helped me tremendously in that process. And that's when I started to take my blinders off and say, holy smokes, is there a lot of help out here? 
up until that point, and we were already on a track of growth, I just didn't even look for the help. And the help doesn't come and poke you and tap you. And even if it does, if you're not looking for it, you don't, you don't recognize it. So one of the things, and, and get ready, Tom, it's coming. One of the things that, that I recognized early is that there is so much help out there that that was almost intimidating as well. I didn't quite know who to ask for what. It's, a, it's a, all of a sudden I realized that there's a lot of these local programs and there's state programs and there's federal programs and this one is maybe going to help me with some of the, the, the currency stuff and they just want to guide me with some of the freight stuff. But I didn't really know the cycle or the order or, or which question to ask first. Should I figure out the freight first? Should I figure out the phytosanitary issues first? So the idea of sort of having a step-by-step -step process has always been very desirable and at each step knowing if you should be talking to Mary or one of her counterparts or, you know, that was always what I found to be missing and, and, and now I'm going to point to him. Tom Hulsman is right there and he's, he's creating that tremendous step-by-step -step. and I think everyone should chase him down and get his card at the end of this uh, because what he's putting together is going to be a tremendous resource. I think it's going to fill a really big hole in the information uh, to help you just check the box and say, okay, just really dumb it down. I've done this, and, I, and these were the, the public resources available to help me, and so I, they got me through this box. Now the next layer, oh, here's some resources to help me. You muddle through those, do your homework, work your butt off, check that box, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and, and I think that uh, that's gonna be a tremendous resource. But yeah, it was, it was daunting. I, and you only have so much time because you're running a business, and you gotta make product, and exactly. you, so you really don't have time to do all of the things that you need to do. Uh, and, and rarely do people, you can't just hire someone to do it because that, you know, we don't live in that type of money tree world. So, um, so that was the challenge. That was a challenge. Spent a lot of evenings and weekends on the, on the internet understanding the mm -hmm. public uh, assistance that's available. And those websites are interesting to say the least. So <laughs> a lot of words, not a lot of pictures. Yeah, and, and, a, and a clear, saying. one clear word, intimidated. It is, in, it is. Um, Weren't you intimidated? It's daunting. Yeah. It's, yes, There's a yeah. lot of information. I mean, and even, even listening to, you know, when bankers start talking about hedging and currencies, if you're not intimate with some of the vocabulary and if you haven't had one of those conversations, you know, by the fourth hedging conversation, it starts to make sense if, if it's not something that you're, you're, it comes natural to you. The first one? Okay, <laughs> I'm going to hedge and it's going to cost me something, okay, and then... It, I don't have enough margin, so now I've got to requote this so that I can afford the hedge and I can afford the duty and afford the phytosanitary and afford the potential demurrage if that's you know some risk I'm taking. So, so yeah, daunting, yes. Unbelievably doable, unbelievably attainable. It's just time consuming. Don't wait to the last minute, right? Yes. Get Tom's checklist right away. <laughs> this is Tom. Raise your, Tom, Tom should at this point raise his hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is there a question over there? Shamelessly plugging, Tom. Uh, let me move on to the next question. What is one final piece of advice you would leave with every participant? And I want Chris and everyone to go down the line and answer that. And now is your time if there's anything else you didn't share that you want to give an example of, or, uh, please do that. Start with Chris. Yeah, I think uh, we've touched base on it a, a little bit already, but. Um, you know, my, my final piece of advice is uh, take your time, uh, partner with somebody that, that you feel like you can trust. Um, if you can afford to go uh, where you're going to be exporting to, uh, make the trip, build those relationships in, in person, um, understand um, a bit about, you know, where you're going to be doing business. And uh, I know that that can be sometimes cost prohibitive, but uh, sometimes a worthwhile investment. And, uh, you know, also um, understand, you know, how, what your limitations are. And uh, sometimes, you know, the way things are done in, in other countries sometimes could be considered unethical or even illegal here. And uh, that's common place there. So you have to understand, you know, what you can do, what you can't do, and uh, set those limits for yourself. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, 
kind of going along with the theme here is leveraging your partners. And, um, you know, a, a sale is not a sale until you get the money in the bank, right? So um, one of the things that I sometimes find frustrating in my job is that our customers often come to me uh, late in the game and they've got a problem with a sale into, you know, some market and they're trying to figure out how to, how to fix it after the fact. So, um, you know, selfishly speaking, bring your banker into the discussion in the early stages when you're exploring a market, figure out, you know, what are common payment tools for this market? What, what should I consider when um, trying to get paid uh, maybe in local currency or, or in dollars. Uh, you know, there's a lot of restrictions on currencies in Latin America. So some of these hedging things that we talk about are a little bit less flexible than, than they are for, say, the Canadian dollar. So those types of things are important to understand rather than just going flying into Argentina and saying I'm going to start selling product in, 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 in pesos. So um, then, you know, how can I mitigate my cross-border payment risk. Um, you know, there's a lot of different tools out there and people often jump straight to looking into getting insurance on, on foreign buyers. And, and if you're a small business that ha doesn't have a real wide spread of risk, uh, you might find that to be almost prohibitively expensive or unavailable. So uh, you may have to leverage some of the more traditional type of of tools like uh, letters of credits and so forth to uh, get those initial sales and then eventually over time maybe you migrate away from them but again leverage your your partners find people that have dealt with those issues in the past and find out what your options are uh, to make sure you get paid because ultimately that's that's what it's all about <laughs> right as an indirect supplier of exporting. Um, I think if, if you have a synergy with, with a partner here as being their supplier or working with them, you have to build a trust between the two of you that you sit down and you're part of the whole picture like we're doing right now with our project. It's from the beginning to the end and, and maybe I love that somebody's going to do something like that. That's wonderful. Because you can follow step by step, and you're working together moving forward. And then everybody in the end result will be happy with it. I would say don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. You know, everything we've said is all very intimidating. But I, I would lead with don't be afraid. Just give yourself time and go for it. <laughs> I mean, because, it, but give yourself time. I mean, it's, it's a process. And uh, I will share just one final story, and it, and, and it caters to, to what Chris said about go visit the marketplace. I was really excited to sell product in, into the European marketplace. I, I've, I've made something now that's a little bit lighter and stronger and cheaper and all those great things you stamp on a box here in America. And, and I flew over there ready to just wow these people with my product, and, and, and they were completely unimpressed. And the reason they were completely unimpressed is because what they're using to do the job, and they're doing something very similar, is completely different than what we're using here. And I thought, you know, well, hey, we're leading the, we're, we're cutting edge, we're leading things. Well, they've been doing it for 100 years as well. You know, they don't, they, they, the idea that we're the only people that have soft, muddy ground and are doing construction and, and, and is absurd. And so I learned a lot, and I brought that back with me, and now we're tweaking our product even further and so that lighter, stronger, cheaper is going to be even better to compete, and we're going to have a product specific for that market. So instead of trying to sell something and jam a square peg in a round hole, we've redesigned a product specific for that market, so it's going to open back up to us again. But, uh, but if I would have taken the same business model in the U.S., you know, which is just sort of build it, put it there, and then wait for the orders to come in, we would have just gotten killed. But, uh, but, but don't be afraid, and, 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 and lastly, Call Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Call Tom. That's an excellent point, Carter. I think with any business, whether you're exporting or not, to try to shove something down a customer's throat that they don't really need. Yeah. So trying to understand the market and, and what the need is out there. We got some really good questions here, by the way. So I'm going to 
someone has to answer these, um, kind of ties into, <laughs> ties into um, what Tom is doing possibly, but uh, maybe Chris or Tom, do you know, <laughs> this is quote, is there an idiot's guide to doing business in various countries um, to learn some of these cultural differences? <laughs> I have no idea. So basically, you've I, so just had to do what you've had to do and do the research on your own. I don't know, maybe Tom or Chris, if you have any experience with this, how well do Latin American countries do business among themselves, and is that a challenge for us as U.S. companies? So I guess that means intra-Latin America. Mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. imagine there's a lot of that. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I would. there is quite a bit of it, and... Uh, I'd say, as, as we saw in the last presentation, there are some differences even within Latin America, right? But uh, there is a little bit more similar alignment, um, so I think a little bit uh, better understanding. But even so, um, the laws are different in, in each country, and business practices do vary. Um, so even, you know, like we were saying, Portugal and, and you know, the Portuguese part of Brazil versus the rest of uh, Latin America speaking Spanish is, is a difference. So um, I think there is that Latin America trade, but it's, it's certainly not automatic. Okay. This one's a, a little bit of a doozy, and if no one has an experience with this, then that's okay. But uh, has anyone had any experience with bribes in Latin America or any of clients have um, I had an experience in, in, in Mexico uh, it's close but I so I, I, I went on an excursion they've got beautiful red oak in Mexico and old growth and that's hard you know the concept of old growth you just don't come across it anymore it's all new stuff grows faster it's poopier they've got beautiful old growth red oak in in Mexico and they don't harvest it in fact they kill it because they don't really have a demand for it and they don't have the demand because they don't really have the tooling. They don't have the sawmills that can sort of work with the red oak. They love pine. Pine's easy to harvest. It's easy to work with. You can use it in furniture, housing, whatever. It's very dynamic. So I made an effort to go down and actually in, upgrade a sawmill and, and get them tooled up so that we could get the red oak from the Sierra Madres Mountains in this little town of Tres Rios and, and get it back. And it's very close to the border. Logistically, it made all the sense in the world. The cost for the raw material is, a, is, is next to nothing. You know, uh, a, a set of tires for their pickup truck once a month and you're good. And you get all the oak you want. But there are six people that you had to pay before you get to the border. And by the time you do that, which I wasn't able to do any, but I had a representative that I had hired that I was working with, a business partner that, that lived there and was from there. And so he was sharing with me, hey, you know, hey, we get this week. We got to pay this guy to get it from point A to point B. And, and meanwhile, we're I'm over at J. And then he calls me and says, "We got to pay B to C." It just didn't work. Massive failure for just that reason. The infrastructure of the briberies was just it was just daunting, wow. daunting, and I couldn't do it. So couldn't make it across. Wow. Yeah. Still Thank haven't you. seen that red oak. I don't know where it is. <laughs> Wrote it off. Yeah, I would uh, say from my experience, um, have come across a multitude of, of occasions where um, shipments were stuck, and uh, you know it, it was said that you know certain things could be done in order to to get things moving, um, and you know I, I represented companies that just refused to do business that way, um, couldn't as as U.S. public traded companies and against policy. Um, but it becomes representing, you know, customers that just want things done sometimes. It, it is difficult, and, and I've heard the stories, well, we talked to such and such, and they said they can do it. Um, that may be the case, you know, I think that's uh, something you have to, you know, answer for yourself, whether that's something you want to do or not, but, uh, you know, the companies I've represented it, in some places in the world would not do business yeah. because that was too common practice. Well, it's probably important for everyone to read up on the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and make sure you're clear on that before you Do jump into something. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank our panelists. They did a great job. If we could give them a round of applause.
guys. <laughs> All set? Go back to your seats Go. now. Um, Thank <laughs> you.